Well, welcome once again to Graceway Baptist Church, and we are doing our Sunday School lesson, and we are moving into the month of August. And so for those of you who are excited about the start of school, it's almost here. For those of you who are dreading it, we'll get ready. And for others, maybe cooler weather in a month or two, and uh, football season and things like that as we go into fall. It's always kind of an exciting time of year, and it seems like that... Um, there's kind of a new burst of energy when we move into the uh, fall of the year. And uh, so uh, as we talk about that, we're going to start off in August by talking about death. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? But we're going through the life of Abraham. And one of the things we have trouble grasping, even though intellectually we know this, but emotionally we don't deal with the fact that we are all going to die and that death is a part of life for us, for our friends, for uh, our loved ones, for neighbors, and all kinds of people. The Bible says in uh, Hebrews 9, it is appointed unto a man once to die, and then the judgment. And even as believers, we don't really like to think about it much. And uh, I can't tell you the number of times when I've been with people who are strong in their faith, but yet they get hit so hard by grief that they ask the question, why? Well, when we're thinking right and when we're not touched by it and not under the throes of, of grief and sorrow, we all know that everybody dies and we all know that the wages of sin is death and we're all sinners. And we know also too that as believers, Christ has paid the penalty for our sin so that when we die, we are able to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And we can sing about that and we can get uh, happy when we sing songs about heaven and going to be with the Lord. And sometimes I've seen you raise your hands. Sometimes I've seen people smile. Sometimes I've seen people wipe away tears while they sing those songs. But when you're going through it, it's a different situation. And I'm sure for most of you, you have been through that to some degree. Uh, I can imagine some things are harder than others. Losing a spouse is, is extremely difficult. Uh, losing a child, I cannot even begin to imagine what it's like to lose a child. Or as a grandfather, I would say a, a grandchild. It just doesn't seem right, doesn't seem normal. And yet uh, all of that is under the control of God, isn't it? And again, that's easy to say when you're not in the midst of it. But when you're in the midst of it, boy, is it ever difficult. Well, when we go to Genesis 23, verses 1 through 9 is basically what we're going to cover. And it's about uh, uh, the life of Abraham, of course. And Sarah, his wife, of all of these years, now she dies. Abraham's left alone. And Abraham grieves. And I know sometimes people come up to you when you lost a loved one and they say, oh, don't grieve. Well, you kind of have to grieve. It's a part of the normal process of dealing with it and adjusting the life without that person that you love. And so uh, Abraham is going to do that. And I think we have to remember, Paul said in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that we are to uh, not be like those who sorrow without hope. We sorrow with hope. Somebody said one time that we as believers, we can smile through the tears. And it's a difficult thing to go through, and you can imagine. And so uh, don't let this be, as we say, just black ink on a white page. This is a real person going through a real tough situation, and uh, it's actually a part of life. We all need to be prepared for it. So our introduction said this is a sad story, but reality for all of us and for those we love. It's not just about us. Everyone is going to go through this. And we must prepare spiritually and physically and even emotionally for that. Death is imminent. We don't know when we're going to die. And that's uh, the mercy of God, isn't it? Can you imagine if everybody had a physical countdown clock on their forehead and you could look and say, oh, you've got another 20 years and someone else going, oh, you've got 15 minutes. Uh, that would be terrible 
to live like that and to know those kind of things. And so we don't know. And we're told in the Bible that we are to always be prepared for it. And we know that uh, David said in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, as we all will, either personally or with someone else that we love, he says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And that's the kind of thing that everybody goes through. Everybody has to be ready for that. We need to think about these things. And we also need to think about the coming of Christ. The one thing that is going to destroy death for the believers, in fact, the Bible says that it is the last enemy to be destroyed, is the coming of Christ. And I think about in the Gospel of John when Jesus stood in front of the tomb of Lazarus, getting ready to raise him from the dead. That's when the shortest verse in the Bible is uh, written. And it says, Jesus wept. Now, why did Jesus weep? He was getting ready to raise Lazarus from the dead. I don't think it was about Lazarus so much. I don't think it was about the resurrection or uh, anything like that. I think as Jesus stood there in a cemetery where there were other tombs, and he saw the result of sin, the result of Genesis chapter 3, the result of the curse upon people. And I think it caused him great, great sorrow, even though he was getting ready to do something absolutely amazing. And so when we think about death, some people say, well, death can be a friend and death is the gateway to God and that kind of thing. Well, the Bible calls it an enemy an enemy that has invaded our life and caused great sorrow and tremendous trauma for people, and it's all because of sin. And Christ is going to destroy that, and um, we look forward to that day and for life eternal. So death is imminent, and so is the coming of Christ. And there are going to be some people, when you read 1 Thessalonians 4, that are going to be alive and they will remain until the coming of the Lord, but some people are not going to make it uh, until that time. And uh, that was a problem for the Thessalonian believers. <coughs> what about those who have already died? Did they miss the coming of the Lord, the rapture? And uh, Paul assures them, no, in fact, they're going to get a head start. We won't precede them. So all of these kind of things are said and uh, given to us so that we might find comfort in this natural progression to the end of life or to the coming of the Lord, whichever may come first. And so regardless, then we're going to have to live by faith and we're going to have to rejoice in hope. It's hard to rejoice in someone's death. It's hard to rejoice in the sorrow and the loneliness and the emptiness that you feel. But you sure can rejoice in the hope. And what is the hope? Christ is our Blessed hope, the Bible says. And so our future is in God's hands, and it does not center merely upon us. And sometimes when uh, someone we love dies or when they're terminally ill or something, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to people that I love? And uh, this is where we have to stop and we have to think unemotionally. This is a part of life. It happens to everyone. It's a part of being on earth and it's the consequence of being a sinner. So we read as we look at our text, uh, so Sarah, let me, uh, I went too far here, excuse me, get back to the right page. Uh, verse 1, it says, Sarah lived 100 and 27 years. That's, that's a pretty good lifespan, isn't it? And these were the years of the life of Sarah. Verse 2, So Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, Kiriath, probably Arba, and uh, that is Hebron. We've heard of Hebron. Hebron is where David the king ruled for, I think it was seven years after Saul died, before he was able to unite all 12 tribes and move the capital to Jerusalem. So uh, Hebron is a pretty important town. And it says, uh, in the land of Canaan, and Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Don't let anybody tell you don't cry. 
Don't let anybody tell you don't mourn or weep or anything. You need to get that out. It's a good thing. Now, I'm sure, like anything, we can go too far with it, but uh, that's a part of life. And it says in verse 3, Then Abraham stood up from before his dead, Sarah's body, and spoke to the sons of Heth. The sons of Heth were Hittites. You've heard of Hittites. Saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my Lord. You are a mighty prince among us, a powerful man. In other words, bury your dead in the uh, choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you, you his burial place that you may bury your dead. Nice of them, isn't it? Verse 7. Then Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land the sons of Heth. And he spoke with them, saying, If it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and uh, meet with uh, Ephron, the son of uh, Zohar, for me. Sometimes those names kind of get to you a little bit, and I look at it and try to do my best with it and then lose my place. Uh, the son of, of Zohar for me, that I may, that he may, excuse me, give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has. So Abraham already had this scoped out and knew what he wanted, which is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me at the full price as property for a burial place among you. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, this is very sad, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, that is Hebron again, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it are deeded to Abraham, it's a legal transaction, by the sons of Heth, the Hittites, as property for a burial place. So you get the picture, Sarah dies. Abraham's got to do something with her remains. And um, so he negotiates with the Canaanites there to buy a piece of land, to buy a, a gravesite, a, a burial plot, we might say. And uh, if you think about it, God had promised Abraham all of this land, but at this point, Abraham didn't own it. His descendants would, but Abraham didn't. And after Abraham negotiates this with these people who apparently respected him and thought well of him because they were very cooperative, and notice that uh, even though he says, give it to me, he says, for the full price. In other words, he's going to pay for this before he takes possession, and it's going to be a legal deeded transaction so that everybody knows with the witnesses that Abraham owns this particular piece of land, and it's going to be a gravesite, a burial place, not only for Sarah, but one day for him and for others of his descendants. And so Moses writes down for the uh, Israelites coming out of Egypt the location of it, because uh, after these hundreds of years since Abraham, the name had changed, and so he is marking the place for them. It is by Hebron. So we look at this and see, number one, grief and loss are the norm for life on earth. And we can't act like it's not, and we can't live in denial of it, even though we don't think about our death every day. And uh, yet we should think about the fact that life is passing by. It goes by quick, more quickly than we might imagine or think that it would. And uh, yet it is happening for all of us. And... Um, when we think about that, we should also think about heaven. We should think about grace. We should think about being absent from the body and present with the Lord, all because Jesus shed his blood for us and took the wrath of God and then rose from the dead. And then the book of Hebrews 
Christ is called the captain of our salvation. That means he's the leader. He is the trailblazer from earth to heaven because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. And we should think about the fact that he's going to return and he is going to destroy death and everything that has to do with that. So hallelujah. Where is the sting of death and all of that that the Bible speaks of? Well, it's going to be destroyed by Christ and by his grace. So Sarah lived 127 years. That's a long time. Now, some people don't get to live that long. And you and I probably will not live that long. Some people don't live long at all. I had a brother that lived 12 hours. I had a sister that was stillborn. Can you imagine? And uh, what is the purpose in all of that? I don't know. How do I make sense of all of that? I can't, other than the fact that I believe they're with the Lord and uh, I'll meet them one of these days. Then there are other people that my great-grandmother lived to be 102, so not quite as old as Sarah, but, I mean, getting up there. What's the purpose in that? Why did she live that long? I don't know. I never met her. And uh, so life, whether it's short or long, is all under the hand of God, if we read Psalm 139 correctly. And so this is Sarah's time, 127 years and so uh, think about it, even that long, I mean a long, long life, especially for us. Now, we might think and kind of fool ourselves, well, if my wife lives to be 127 years old and I'm older than she is, as I am, then uh, when that happens, I'll be more ready for it because we're both really old. Did you ever think like that? Did you ever think that death and sorrow and suffering like that didn't bother old people? I used to go to my grandparents' house in uh, Rogers, Arkansas, and my parents would always say I had to sit and visit with them for a while before I went out and played or did whatever I wanted to do. And they taught me respect for old people and to uh, listen to their stories and, and be interested in what they have to say. And I can remember we would sit down and we would be talking. And, of course, my mom was raised in Rogers. And uh, so my grandparents would start talking about who was in the hospital, who had died, what funerals they had been to lately. And I would just think, good night. This is just morbid. I want out of here. And I kind of had the idea that apparently death was not uh, sad or creepy or spooky or anything like that to old people. And uh, so I, I just thought as I get older, death won't bother me anymore. That, that is a fallacy, isn't it? I don't care if someone you love lives to be old like Sarah did. You're not ready for them to die. You would wish for one more day. Abraham would feel just like you feel and uh, maybe even worse because he's been with her for so long and with all of the adventures they have had moving from Ur of the Chaldees to uh, Canaan and all of the things that they experienced, the birth of Isaac. I mean, all of that is just absolutely miraculous and amazing. And now it's over. A great man like Abraham has lived his life following God and now it is the end of an era. What does he do? What does he think? How is he going to carry on without the one that he loves? Well, let's remember even believers go through the stages of grief. I've got them written down here, the uh, Kubler-Ross uh, stages of grief. This happens when someone gets a terminal illness, and this also happens when we lose somebody that we care about. And uh, she was a psychiatrist that was born in the 1920s and died, I think, in 2004. She was originally from Switzerland, which sounds about right, doesn't it? And uh, she died in the United States, and she wrote a book about all of this. And uh, she said that there is first a denial, I just can't cope with this, so I'm not going to deal with it. And then there is anger when finally the full weight of it hits you. You can't believe it's happening to you. It doesn't seem to be fair. It doesn't seem to be right. And then there's a bargaining stage. Well, 
Uh, maybe you say to God, God, if you'll take this pain and this grief and this heartache away from me, or if somebody's terminally ill, if you'll just free them from the cancer or the ALS or whatever they have, I promise I'll be a better church member. I promise I'll give more money to the church. I promise I'll stop this particular habit or sin, the bargaining stage. And then when that doesn't work, then people fall into a time of depression. And it feels like the weight of the world is on their shoulders. It feels like uh, that even when the birds are singing in the trees, how dare they do that? When people have to leave, maybe they've been hanging around you for a while to help you out and to help you with the estate and to help you with the funeral. Now they have to leave and they have to go back to their life. How dare they go back to their life? How can the world continue on during this time? And then it resolves into the acceptance phase of this. Well, this is the way it is and I've got to make the most of it. And uh, people don't always go through this in that particular order. And uh, sometimes we think that, well, I'm done with the denial stage. Whew, glad that's over with. But you can go back into that and back into the anger stage. And everybody is a little bit different. So Abraham has to go through these same things too. You're not exempt from this just because you're a believer, even if you are a patriarch. And so... Uh, some go through this quickly, some slower, some repeat the cycle, and some don't experience every stage, or at least they don't appear to. So this is something we have to kind of be ready for and something that we have to think about because it's going to hit everybody, all of us, right? So number two, life is long enough to fulfill the purpose of God. Now, I don't know why Sarah had to live this long and we don't know anything about whether she suffered as she got older or not. We don't know if she was crippled. We don't know if she uh, had dementia. We don't, um, nothing is told about any of that. She was just uh, old and very old when she died. And so um, when we uh, consider all of that, how long did she live? Let's just put it this way. Long enough? Long enough. How long is... Uh, a good life? I don't know. I remember my dad telling me several years before he died that he kind of thought that 85 was pretty good way. He didn't want to live too long and outlive everybody that he knew. And he didn't want to die too soon either. And guess what? He died at 85. Uh, we don't always get that wish, do we? And uh, how long do we live? Well, some people like David Brainerd, an early missionary in early America to the... Uh, Native Americans there, tremendous believer. He only lived 28 years. Then we find other people that had very, very short lives. And then we find others that lived uh, kind of to middle age and others that lived on into old age. How long do you live? Let's just put it this way. Long enough to fulfill everything that God has ordained for you to do. Remember Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 tell us about salvation. But verse 10 tell us about the works we do because we're saved, not to get saved, but because we're saved, and they're works that God has ordained that we should perform. How long do you live? Long enough to do everything God requires of you, and hopefully you're faithful in doing that. And so uh, Abraham comes to mourn for Sarah, and he is weeping for her. And Jesus, remember, wept at the tomb of Lazarus. And when um, Paul was on his way to Rome for trial, when he met with the Ephesian elders, is that in Acts 21, I think, or somewhere in that area? They wept because they knew they would see his face no more. There's sorrow and sorrow imparting, and it's, and it's a tough thing to go through. So all believers live long enough to complete their assignment, and yet it's painful whenever they leave. Number three. Sarah's death was a reality check. The promise was for the future. What do I mean by that? Well, think about what they had done. We mentioned this earlier. They left Ur of the Chaldees and uh, they go to the promised land and think about all the things that they experienced and the miracle and the joy of Isaac's birth, the confirmation of the covenant and the promise and the future of the Jew, the future of the nation of Israel, Abraham's descendants. Man, that is just amazing. 
And Sarah has Isaac at an advanced age, and Abraham has his son at an advanced age as well. And it's easy when you're in the midst of all of that. You're busy, life is going on, things are going well, and miracles are happening. Boy, isn't it wonderful? And sometimes you just kind of forget, and you think, well, it'll just be this way forever. We'll just do this again. We'll just keep doing this for another 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It'll just go on and on and on. Well, the reality is that's only for heaven, not down here on earth. Down here on earth, things are coming to an end for the great and for the small, for the known and for the unknown, for the important and for the unknown, for those who have great memorials and statues and things like that made for them after they die, and for those who are in an unmarked grave. It doesn't matter. It comes for all of us, and that's why we call it a reality check. Here they go, these people who are instrumental in the covenant of God coming to pass, and then all of a sudden, one of them dies. And it's a reminder to Abraham, you're going to die too, and you're probably not going to see much of the outgrowth of the covenant. Yes, you have Isaac, That's only one. Your descendants are going to be like the stars of the heaven or the dust of the earth or the sands of the sea. But you're not going to be around for that, Abraham. This is talking about the future. This is talking about something that is bigger than you. This is talking about something that will outlive you. And this is kind of a a wake-up call for him. And so it says that Abraham stood up from before his dead, spoke to the sons of Heth, saying all that stuff about being a foreigner, and I want property, I want to buy property that I might bury my dead. And so, uh, interestingly enough, living in the promised land, the only thing Abraham ever legally owned and possessed there was a cemetery. And it's going to be used for some of his his descendants, but uh, there's something else that was happening here. And uh, this is something we don't always think about. I mean, occasionally we do. How many times have you had somebody maybe in our church that they die? We have the funeral here for them, and then uh, their burial is going to be in their hometown. And we've had a few times where we had a long funeral procession, and I don't mean long in the number of cars, long in the number of miles to take them to their uh, burial site, which was in their childhood home maybe or something like that. And that's the way it was in the day of Abraham. You buried people back where they came from. And uh, Abraham was saying, nope, we're not going back. We're not going back where we used to be. This is now the place where the family lives. We're looking ahead to the future, and we are burying them here in Canaan in the promised land. So everything has changed here And Abraham is looking a different way and he's thinking about the future, the future that is not going to include him, but it is going to include all of his family member. And so uh, the full extent of God's promises are well beyond Abraham's earthly life. You can get that through the bullet points here. And so... uh, We tend to think the normality of life is like it is right now. And uh, that is for this particular phase of life, but that's not normal. Normal is to be persecuted. Normal is to suffer. Normal is to have sorrow. Normal is to have sickness. And normal is to die. That is the state of humanity. And that's why we need a Redeemer, because only Christ can pull us out of that. An old uh, epitaph on an old tombstone said, Remember me as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you shall be. So prepare for death and follow me. Well, that's true, isn't it? And we forget about that sometimes. The old people we're around now, one time they were young. They were babies. They were little children. They were growing up and getting married and having children of their own and looking toward the future. We forget that sometimes. And people that are in the cemeteries, when we see their tombstone, their marker, that we look at that and we marvel at the, at the date on the stone, and yet uh, 
They were just like us at one time. And on this particular gravestone, somebody scratched in it and said, to follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. So amen for that, right? So even under the blessing of God, which Abraham had, life can kind of be taken for granted. The problem with life is it is so daily and it just kind of drags on. But boy, does it ever when it comes closer to the end, go by fast. Time for me right now goes by faster than ever in my life, and I assume that'll get even faster as I get older. And number four, the land promised to Abraham started with a cemetery. Let's think about that. Started with a cemetery, because it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We just can't escape it. It is the, the reality of our life. And so um, Abraham goes and he actually buys the land. He doesn't just demand it, give it to me, I want it. And uh, I'm a man of God, you ought to give it to me. No, he actually pays for it because he wants to have a respectful burial for Sarah. And uh, you know what happens to corpses. It's you know, don't mean to be disrespectful or anything like that. So Abraham can't just leave her there on the bed in the tent or anything like that. He's got to do something with her. And notice in there it says that uh, he wants to bury her out of sight because that would be a gruesome, horrible thing to look at all the time. And Abraham's got to continue to live even after his mate is gone. And so he says, I'll give you the full price for uh, the property, a property that will be for the burial of those that I love. Alan P. Ross wrote a book on uh, the book of Genesis, and he says, the inclusion of the genealogy of Nahor just previous to this chapter, you can go back and look at that, reminds the reader that the ancestral home is the, uh, is the east, but the account of the burial of the land of, in the land of promise, informs the reader that there was no, this is important, going back for Abraham. The future was in Canaan, even though the first recipients of the promise uh, would die before that promise could be realized. And isn't that true for us as well? There are a lot of things that you wish for, a lot of things you pray for, a lot of things that are good things, godly things, spiritual things that you want to see happening, and you will probably die without seeing a lot of them accomplished. And yet at the same time, maybe after your death, maybe it's through your death that one of your uh, descendants a child, a grandchild, maybe a cousin or somebody like that may come to know the Lord and they may be the instrument in answering those things that you have prayed for so long. Maybe one of them grows up and becomes a great reformer that brings a spiritual awakening to the United States of America. You're gone, but they live on and they carry on. This is what Abraham is facing. And so this is more than just Abraham taking care of business. He's really looking ahead, remembering the promise and saying, this is where we're putting down our roots in the land that God has promised us. And so burying Sarah in Canaan was a statement of faith in the promises of God. So thinking about all of that and kind of wrapping it up here, then uh, we understand that this is going to be a place where more than one person is going to be buried in that particular cave. It's the burial of Abraham, burial place of Abraham and of Sarah and of Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Leah. Not Rachel, interestingly enough. So when we think about this, let's remember 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. That's why we've got to set our mind on things above, as the book of Colossians says. We need to be heavenly minded. So let's conclude here, and we'll just read through these real fast. Number one, God's people grieve and die without seeing promises fulfilled. Number two, 
God's people believe in a life and future beyond the grave. Amen. Number three, God's people testify of hope in God's word in both life and in our death. There's a purpose in all of that. And number four, God's people should prepare themselves and their descendants for a future without them. And so uh, those of you who have lost parents, not have lost parents, but have had parents that have died like I have, you know it's difficult. Life without them is difficult. And I'm thankful that I had Christian parents. And I'm thankful that they did everything they could to prepare me for life without them. And my dad in particular, he had everything set up, his estate, his funeral plans and all of that set up so that my brother and I really didn't have many decisions to make. We just did what was supposed to be done because he was ready and he was preparing us for the time when they wouldn't be around any longer. Kind of like what Abraham is doing here. Let's learn from that lesson and let's think about it. Not be afraid of it, but let's rejoice in the Lord in the life that we have and in the future that we have even beyond the grave. So we'll stop there and then we will carry on more in the life of Abraham next week. So as we learn this and as we grow through this, may the Lord bless us. Thank you for your time. And uh, teachers, God bless you as you teach. And for those of you who watch this to keep up with us, God bless you for that as well. And uh, we'll see you next week.